This is the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we teach you the proven methods to grow your seven-figure business to 10 million and beyond. Please welcome your host, Brett Gilliland. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast. Every single week, we get to bring another amazing guest, somebody who's been there, done that when it comes to the seven-figure growth journey. And we're excited to bring another amazing guest today. So let me welcome Rob Rawson to the show. Uh, Rob, thank you for being on the podcast. Awesome to chat with you. I need to tell everybody who you are. So let me let me share. Rob is a former, uh, is a trained medical doctor. But several years ago, he started a company called Time Doctor. And he now has over 100 people, 130 some odd people across many, many time zones throughout the world. And he is an expert when it comes to leading, managing, growing remote teams. He wrote a book that helps other people figure this stuff out. The book is called Running Remote. You should check that out, Running Remote. And uh, he's also involved in philanthropy. He's just an all around good and busy guy. So thanks for being here, Rob. Please fill in some of the blanks or some of the holes that I'm, I might have left in your background. We just want to have enough context so that people understand who they're listening to, what kind of experience you bring to this conversation. Sure. Yeah, I actually studied medicine. But I was always entrepreneurial, at, even while I was doing medicine. So I actually took a year off to do a marketing consulting uh, gig, and I was starting businesses all the time. So I had this entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and medicine is amazing. Obviously, it's an incredible profession, and it's something that was hard to leave eventually. But I became quite successful in one of the businesses. And then as a bit of a pull to say, well, you know, I ha can't really be a full doctor. I've got to, if you're being a doctor, you have to dedicate your life to it, right? You can't be half a doctor. You're just not really going to be in fair service to your patients. So I actually started to dedicate more to uh, entrepreneurship and, and let go of my medicine. And then I also did an adventure where I went to the Philippines and lived there for a while because I I wanted to get that team built. That was a, just a great place to build a team, lower cost. It was really effective and was really interesting. I wanted to try a different experience. Uh, while I was there, I realized that I didn't like this office that I'd built. I ended up building an office with 40 people and it was expensive. It was difficult. I, I didn't really want to live in the Philippines anymore. I didn't, didn't like the weather. I was, I was trying to explore and maybe go around the world and travel. And so I decided that I want to get rid of the office. But then I created this software, Time Doctor, to make sure I knew what was happening and to be clear with the team and to have a, a level of accountability. So that's how it started in the beginning. And then it's evolved from there to be more about process improvement, things like that. So that's how I started it in the beginning. And it's, it's uh, we were also been remote from the beginning before COVID. So we, we have been a completely remote team, which is a really interesting experience. And, and we started a conference called Running Remote and a book called Running Remote as well. Well, that's a great backdrop to our conversation today. And, and congratulations on what you've built. Uh, I think what what a cool thing that you had a leg up on the rest of us when COVID happened and we were all trying to figure out how to do this remote thing. There are many business owners, including yourself, who had been running that way for some time and just felt like this is normal. This is not bad. Yeah. We know, we know yeah. what to do. So i um, glad that you didn't have to experience the disruptive nature of trying to figure out remote when that happened and that you could be a resource to others who were trying to figure it out. Well, let's let's shift gears. You, you are a time doctor. We'll, we'll go with that. You're a time doctor. You've written a book called Running Remote. So you know that part of the business really well and how to how to build remote teams and and be productive. Um, all of those things. I would like to I'd like to like open up your brain a little bit and get you talking about some of those those scaling years when you were going from one to 10 million from seven figures to eight figures 
there's a lot of transitions in the business and in yourself as a leader that need to happen in order for that scaling to take place. And so yeah. I could generalize and, and share a lot of the common things, but I'd really just love to have you zero in on the, on the few lessons that really helped you through that journey that might be helpful to others who are trying to do the same. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when I was seven figures, I had a fairly small team and very low cost team as well. And I was necessary because it was bootstrapped. And so we didn't, we never raised money. And so we had to do everything as low cost as possible. So that was good, actually. Um, it was really great strategy, uh, but you kind of evolve. Obviously, you need a higher level team member. So we did have a period where it was actually during COVID where a lot of our senior team members either got up leveled. So they we hired someone to manage them or that we let them go. So that was a really difficult period. Like I think you go as, as a growing pain for the business that was really interesting, difficult. Uh, because I've read about it, I've, I actually listened to lots of podcasts as well about business. I've read lots of books. So I have that mindset that I needed to do that. Uh, and that was probably helpful as well. Uh, having re more of a recent thing is is the structure that I've put in place where I have myself and then directly under me as a president and everyone reports to to him. And that's a really, and then having really clear roles and accountability for the senior leadership team, making sure that we're got the right people in the right seats for all of those senior leadership team. Like that's fundamentals, but most people don't get that right. And And I was doing all of the, like the busy work for the entire business as we were growing it. So I have a business partner. He was more focused on the marketing, but I was doing the operations of, of basically managing everyone. And that's a really heavy lift. And so more recently I've hired that president. Actually I had a bit of a failure in trying to hire that president, but I eventually hired a president that was successful. And that's been a huge improvement for me personally where I have more flexibility and, and now I've got to another level in the business where I don't have to be there for every single decision that it's, it's a business that actually does run without me to some degree or to a large degree. So that's a huge improvement, but yeah, there's that's lots of other things I can share as well. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt, but I do want to rewind a little bit. Because yeah. what you're talking about now with this next level of organization where you've got a president involved, uh, like a yeah. real leadership team, that uh, our listeners are going to get to that hopefully at some point. But but let's, let's stay in that place where you realize, hey, some of the people that came along with me at the beginning and helped me get this thing going, they're no longer able to be in the seats that I need as I'm, as I'm forming a leadership team. I'm having to hire other people in. That, that challenge is one that I think a lot of business owners don't anticipate. They're like, well, these people are, they're coming with me and I feel loyal to them and, and they've done mm. all these great things. But at some point we sort of max out what they're able to do. And yeah. they, they just don't know what it looks like after that. They've never been there. Yes. And you need yes. to bring in some outside people. So I heard you describing that. I'd like, I'd like to dig in on that a little bit more because there's, there's a lot of real emotion involved like these people have been loyal to me uh you know we've developed relationships and now they just aren't the right people to help me go from where we are to where we're going next that's that's a hard thing can we talk about what that was like for you yeah it was difficult and it's difficult in many ways because one way you don't even know if these that you need a new person is this person capable there's so many questions and and it's not clear but i mean i myself are going through another level right so i'm going to the next level by the way i think this is more in a five million to ten million stage like one to five million i think you're more actually just going with your existing team unless they're, they're all the time you need to have the capable people but there right. just is a different type of skill the larger you are, which is more about management and getting the right people underneath you. 
but I actually struggled multiple times with the people that I hired to do that. So it wasn't just the fact that on existing team members, I was fairly clear that they weren't right. Uh, some of them in terms of their team dynamics. So maybe they were good at their job, but they're really not that good at interacting with other people or at hiring the next level underneath them, or they even just resisted growing. Like they didn't want a larger team. Like they really, really didn't want it. Um, and, you know, you see that, especially for people that are a bit more introverted, they might be drawn to my business uh, developer types as well. Uh, like in our developer organization, you'd have some people that would be amazing at actually the work of development, but not so good at actually hiring other developers, managing and working with them. Uh, so that that's really interesting and that, that it, it directly ties to their personalities. Uh, but it doesn't make it easy to hire the outside person because I've made a lot of mistakes with the outside people. Like I hired salespeople, sales leadership that, that didn't work multiple times. So, or it was like marginally it's uh it's it's a it's i think the the learning that you constantly constantly learning is that you do hold on a bit long too long like oh maybe this is going to work out uh maybe it's maybe it's going to turn around and usually it doesn't and especially with a senior person i think you know if you have a if I, I have like a, maybe a lower cost person in the Philippines as an assistant and I'm paying them a thousand dollars a month and it's not quite right. That's a little bit more understandable versus hiring someone a thousand, a hundred thousand a year. Like you really got to They have to be right. Like yeah. there's no, there's no question marks. You know, when you got someone on six figures, like they have to be the right person. That's right. And every time I've delayed with that higher salary person, and and thought, oh, maybe it's going to work. That was a mistake. So that was definitely just make that quick decision is uh, is really important. Well, let's yeah. let's talk about both of those things because one of them was yeah. like, how do I know how to hire the right person? Like, you got it wrong a couple of times trying to hire somebody more senior in, didn't get it right. Yeah. Now you've learned some things about what to look for or or. Yeah. I don't know how to improve the selection process so that you don't make the mistakes as often. And then the other side was, and if they, if I do get somebody in who doesn't fit, who isn't working out, how would I, how would I be able to tell that sooner and take action on that? So I'm not yes. carrying a high dollar person. So let's start with the one that, that you started with, which was, you know, I knew that I need to go outside and, and you mentioned this five to 10 million range. Um, I don't think you've heard me mention on this show in this pa in the past, but we have this view of the stages of small business being on the ones and threes of revenue. So one to three million, right. three to ten million. Every time you triple, there's like a new thing happening. So whether yes. it's three million or five million, that that early seven. Yeah, that figures, range is about right. Yeah, yeah, at that early seven figures, you could probably get most of your team to go where you need to go for the most part. But then after that, you really do have to form like a real leadership team. And so when it's time to hire that real leadership team, whether it's that three million or five or somewhere around there, and you start bringing in these higher dollar hires and, the, and they don't work out, it's painful. So what, what have you learned about hiring in more experienced leaders onto the team that might be helpful to somebody else. So what do you look for? Or how do you yeah. build the selection process to get that right more times than not? So I think it's the clarity of the skills and the, there was someone that I hired that I felt, oh, this is a really great person. I think they were a really great person. A lot of the people that I hired were really great people, but their personality maybe was more inclined towards uh, maintaining things or towards uh, safety. Uh, so I didn't do personality tests. Maybe that's something that I could have done, but uh, that that inclination to be more uh, trying to be safe and, and not to grow um, versus the, the new general manager that I hired, his focus is on growth sales, marketing, and that has come through. And that was my frustration. And now I've, I've sold that in hiring the new person. So it was literally just where is their mindset when they're trying to run a company? Uh, I know it sounds silly, but it, it seems obvious to a business owner the mindset should be on growth and sales. 
But a lot of people that are not business owners, that's not where their mindset is initially coming from. Uh, and for other businesses, it may be that you need someone more focused just on product and building the best product possible. So I'm not saying it's only sales and marketing. Um, but yeah, very basic stuff. But I was not clear uh, at all and uh, that th this was the right person. Uh, and it took me quite a while to understand that. Um I actually so I think it's really difficult. Yeah, I think it's it's not it's it's not like an easy simple formula uh, that 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 you've got. And and sometimes I've been really rigorous. I've, I've had like twenty different people that we've looked at, and then we've narrowed it down, and that didn't necessarily work. Better than just having one referral and that person is just hit it out of the the ball out of the park. It was just really worked straight away. So yeah. yeah, there's not necessarily a formula, but I think if you fix it, if you, if you do your best and then you fix it quickly as well, and maybe that's not the right thing to say, but uh, I think you, you're kind of learning as you go and you get your instinct. Like I didn't have any other jobs before this, right? I was a medical doctor. Like that's completely unrelated mm -hmm. in terms of the skill of identifying if this person is the right person. But there is sometimes, I, I tell you one person that we we've found that is running our conference. Uh, and that was pretty amazing experience and in, uh, in hiring him. And he was actually untested. Uh, like he hadn't really done a lot of, he didn't have a big background kind of resume. But at that time, what I did is I hired multiple people to do the same job and a project like a small project. And then who was the most enthusiastic, who was, who was really driving it forward I like that. Uh, if I if I'm in the if I was starting a business again and I'm kind of on more of a scrappy stage, that's what I would try to do is to have almost like contractors do a little bit of work, like two three people people, and then wow. basically pick the one who's really the best. So it's like it's almost like the survival of the fittest um, because the interview process it doesn't. It's not great. Like you can't really always tell from the interview. I, I think if you're good at interviews, maybe you can, but it's it's difficult. Like the on the job is different than than the initial interview experience. Well, <clears throat> my job here is to pull out what I think are key learnings for people. So I'm going yeah. to summarize a few things. One of them is you need to get clear. You as the hiring leader, whether you're the owner of the business or one of the you know senior leaders or leaders in the in the business, whoever's hiring. You have to get absolutely clear first about what success looks like in the role. And a lot of us yes. get really clear that we need somebody to lead marketing or we need somebody to lead product. And so we put yeah. out that job posting and we say product leader or marketing leader. And, and we grab bullets, you know, we, we grab all the qualifications from somebody else's job post and we throw it all together and say, help wanted, right? And we hope we cross our fingers and hope that the right people show up. But we have to get more clear than that. And once we are more yeah. clear about what does success look like in the role, what are the behaviors, the experiences, the 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 attitudes, the what are the what are we looking for, the qualities in the right candidate to produce those successful outcomes, the better we get at at defining and describing what that what that role really is and what it takes to be successful in that role, we're going to be much more likely to be able to select for that person. And, and even then, I think Rob, there's a lot of realistic uh, tone in your, in your approach to this. Like, even then we're not going to be perfect at it. So when we get it wrong, let's identify it right away. If we got it wrong and, and move on. And yeah. all, all along the way, we're learning, we're improving our ability to assess talent as we go through these cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I have, just want to add another thing about who you're hiring in the first place, because often as business owners, we hire to build the business up. Like we basically hire salespeople or marketing people we think we need to hire to grow our business. And actually, I think a better approach is to hire someone to replace what you're doing. Mm. So it's a totally different mindset. It's like, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to free up my time. And what I'm, what I'm doing, that's what I need to hire for so that then I'm free to focus on bigger picture stuff, to focus on growth, to focus on the next step. 
Um, now I'm actually going to attribute that to Dan Martel, uh, who's a SAS, SAS coach that I've, yeah, I've yeah, worked I with. He, I've he, talked to Dan. He yeah. Told, yeah, he told me that. So I, I, I really like that. And I, I think it's a bit of a mistake that, that the small businesses, uh, small medium businesses in the, in the one to 10 million range, it's just, it's always your first thing is like, how can I grow? Which is great thought, but maybe before doing that, hire or what you're doing so that you're completely free. And that complete freedom gives you so much room to explore and grow. And you're going to naturally grow the business yourself a lot of business owners are better at the marketing or the sales. I was never good at sales myself. And so that's actually where I struggled from because we transitioned from a completely a website where people are just signing up online. And that was great. We were good at that, but that was a certain limit. And then when we got the sales team, I never did it myself. And so I, I struggled multiple times with that. But uh, eventually we're figuring that out, hiring somebody who's good at sales. And um, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's just another learning that I've had as well. Really, really great learning. Um, I don't want to forget all the learnings I heard. One of, one of the other learnings I heard from you was kind of a try before you buy, right? Let's, let's, let's work right, on a little right. project, yes. right? If we can, yes. if there's something we can organize and pay somebody to do, just to see how they approach it, how they communicate with us, what, what's the quality of their work, how fast are they, all of those things that try before you buy. And if you can get, uh, you didn't use this term, but multiple horses in the race, right? You can see who who outpaces the other, who's outworking the others, who, who yes. fits better with the team. And so a try yeah. before you buy and getting two or three of them that you're trying at the same time shows the contrast between those people and you, you, you end up with yeah, a better yeah, selection. Yeah. 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 Love that a lot. Um, okay. And then this last thing you added also equally valuable, super valuable. We have to figure out um, how to, how to hire to free ourselves up. Um, I have a good friend named Clay Mask, who's the, actually the one who introduced me to Dan Martell. I worked with Clay at a software company for 10 years and we went from seven figures to a hundred million you know, we had this, we had this big growth success and he, he described it this way. He said, entrepreneurship is an exercise in relinquishing control. And that's yeah. just another way to talk about that mindset of, I'm not just hiring to go get more sales. I'm hiring to relinquish control. Once I organize the work that I'm doing enough that I can identify an owner and give it to them. Now I can do other higher value tasks. I can go build out new sales funnels or marketing capabilities. I can go work on product vision. I can go build a leadership team, whatever I need to be doing to get us to that next level, as long as I'm not bogged down in the day to day, but we have to get yeah. better as business owners at identifying chunks of work that we're doing, organizing that, getting clear on what that really looks like to do it well, and then give it to somebody else so that we can move on yeah. to the next thing. So I love how you yeah. described that. Very good. Uh, anything else, Rob, as you think back on that seven to eight figure journey, you're, you're building teams, you're learning how to, how to select the right team members, you're letting go of responsibilities as quickly as you can. Um, uh, what about like, let, let me call them coordinating rhythms. All right. Um, as the team grows, especially in a, ro a remote environment, how do you take, a team that's that's distributed and growing how do you manage the complexity of that so we're all pulling together towards the same goal everybody's doing their part towards a unified objective are, are, yeah. are there planning or coordinating rhythms that you had to put in place to make yeah. that happen yeah we have a structure for that which is based on a weekly meeting uh, that is basically with our different leadership levels and then we have also uh, goals or rocks, we call them. And those are basically like what you're going to do for the next 90 days. Uh, so we follow something called EOS, which you might have heard of before. Absolutely. Which is, which yeah. is, yeah, we have our own version of it, but we those rocks are really important. So making sure that everyone's clear on what they're going to do and what everyone else is doing. Uh, it's not perfect, I would say, but it definitely keeps us aligned. 
And I think having that spirit where you have meetings within your peers and you're able to discuss and debate and actually kind of challenge each other and say, like, I disagree with that and have everyone commit to the one uh, thing that we're going to do. Or if people are disagreeing, then they disagree. And then the leader says, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And then we all commit to it. That kind of structure is really important as well. So that's, is synchronous, uh, which means we're in a call and doing that all to, together. But the, when you're working remotely, there's a lot more asynchronous stuff, which means you're recording videos or you're recording messages or you're sending messages. So we have often in our company all hands announcements. We have things uh, with our vision. So we've got our company values that we're constantly reinforcing, our vision of where we're going, uh, we have a um, all of the the vision that's that we're constantly saying this is what our vision is and and you know here's what's exciting and then we're also praising people and all of this all of this stuff is done remotely uh, in asynchronous messages so we we need to get better at that like it's a constant practice uh, this remote work uh, is has been something that's forced on people with these with COVID but. The companies that are really good at it, there's companies like GitLab. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, mm -hmm. but they're a billion dollar company and they're remote. And there's a few others like multi-billion dollar companies that are like fully remote, like not even a single office, which is incredible. And they've been doing it for many more years and they actually really do have it figured out. I'd say we've got it figured out better than average, but they've got it even figured out to a better level. That's what we actually covered in our book. We kind of interviewed a lot of them and said, what are you guys doing? And and they they told us that asynchronous is a huge factor there. So it's how do you find the information? How do you make sure people can get it and can see it and, and know where it is and they can digest it when they want to? It's also good because meetings can really interrupt people a lot. So they can take a lot of time and it can actually distract and maybe you don't need to be in that meeting. So a lot of people, when they went from the in-office to remote, the, the default was just a lot of meetings, like a lot of Zoom time. And that's probably not the most effective. It's it's some balance where, where you do have meetings because you need to have that face-to-face -face or you know, like virtual face-to-face, -face, but you also need to have a lot of time for yourself and you need to be able to digest material more quickly by just reading it, listening to it. And that's a, that's that asynchronous kind of uh, type of communication. Great, great tips. Uh, I just think about the challenge that we all have in any business, but especially as we're growing and the complexity is growing by the number of people and the number of interactions between people that that increases as the as the team size grows. And we still have the challenge of targeted, coordinated action. Right. And that's gr that's more and more people. But we got to come together in targeted, coordinated action. Yeah. And I love the yeah. distinction you made between synchronous and asynchronous. But whatever whatever realities that you're working with in your business, we have to set up the the meeting rhythm and the structure that that and the tools that people can use to make sure we're all pulling the same direction. And, and yeah. we didn't start this place, but you mentioned vision. You mentioned values. So that clarity, again, we're back to that word clarity, and you're always leading to that. I heard you say, we're bringing it up all the time when we get together, we're talking about our, our vision and we're celebrating people living the values and that kind yes. of clarity is important exactly. to bring everyone together. So I uh, yeah. love those examples. Anything else? Yeah, even more. About? Yeah, even more when you're remote, because it's harder because you, you're there in person, you get a bit more natural it just naturally comes across and you're just naturally chatting to people. Uh, but when you're remote, it doesn't happen as often and you feel disconnected. And so you have to create that feeling that you're part of something, that you're moving towards something. Mm -hmm. you're, this is that it's exciting. Like, like, look what we're doing. You know, it's um, it's really got to be intentional for the leadership. And I'd say like, we do that intentionally, but I need to constantly do it more. Like it's, there's, it, you need to over communicate when you're remote because it doesn't happen naturally. So what, what tends to happen is everyone's just sitting there from home and they just, they don't really even feel like they're part of something like they paid their salary, but you know, I'm not, is this really something I'm a part of, or it's just, it feels a bit disconnected. You see, you know what I'm saying? I do. So you've got to counter that. 
Yeah, and and what I hear you saying is maybe maybe CEO stands for chief engagement officer, chief energy officer. Like, how do you how do you fuel that kind of connectedness over time and space when you got all this remote team? And so you yes. have to you have to go even further to to try to make that happen when we're not coming together and at least you know like fueling off of each other's energy when we're in the same room physically yes in a remote yes. situation you have to you got to manufacture that through your leadership it's all communication um yeah and you can't just assume that it's going to be okay like you got to be fanning that flame always yeah yeah absolutely yeah. well uh it, it's clear to me uh hopefully it's everybody listening that the lessons you've learned over the last several years truly qualify you to help people understand what's coming. Um, all the things that I see eight figure businesses have figured out, they're coming out of your mouth, whether, whether you know how to call them out specifically or not. Like I, I hear every point along the way, you got to be clear. you got to have a vision. you got to surround yourself with the right people. you got to give them ownership. Uh, you got to set up the right processes and structure to, to coordinate yep. a, a, an ever-growing team. You got to keep them engaged and excited. Like always setting the vision, always reinforcing that. Like you're you're saying all the things and and all of our one to three million dollar business owners right now are saying, that sounds like a lot. I'm I'm doing all this right now. How how could I possibly do that? And so to you know to bring it back full circle, when you hire the people that can take stuff off of your plate, carry some of that burden with you or for you then you can yeah. be freed up to do some of these other things that rob is talking about and it's absolutely essential if you want to scale yeah yeah hiring those people to be able to do your work is just so critical but i would say also now this is maybe not what people want to hear but it does depend on the type of business as well because for some types of businesses it's it's going to be a lot of work and it's harder to it's possible for every business. If, you, if you're successful, you've got enough margin, you can hire people. But it is easier for some businesses to be able to leverage yourself out of the, the business. And some other businesses, you're always going to be drawn back in. Um, so, and, and they're going to be more struggles. Maybe it's a lower margin business, then you can't afford to hire someone that has that salary level. So the type of business is critical as well. And that's really difficult because you're already in one type of business you're like well how do i get out of that <laughs> or what do i do now so but it's something you have to think about because it's it's really critical if you're in a low margin business uh yeah like you're 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 going to struggle to do some of these things like how can you hire someone when you're in a low margin business like you don't have any profit if you do that that's right and and we don't get into business models a lot here but since you're bringing it up rob um what my, I guess my recommendation for those who feel like they might be inclined to put themselves in that camp right away and say, yeah, most of what Rob said doesn't apply to me because now I'm in this low margin business and he just sort of gave me a pass to check out. I, okay. I, would, I would challenge it just a little bit because the principle still stands. And so the problem for you needs to be, how do I, how do I get better at the use of my time and how do I organize work in a way that we can actually accomplish more with the, with the current team than we were before, right? Like it yep. push to get even better internally goes way up that, that need to get better goes up if you're in a low, lower margin business so that you can create some space to bring on some more help. Uh, but it's yep. possible. I've seen people do this in low margin cleaning companies. I've seen people do this in, in other home service types of businesses that, you would think yeah. are, are lower margin. You can't outsource to you know a low cost VA somewhere else a home service visit. Like you have to have somebody yes. who's skilled and who comes in and does the work. And so I've seen it in all types of businesses. Uh, some some models have a little bit more room for it than others. And so I, I I take the point. You're you're right, Rob. Yeah, but, but there will be cleaning businesses that are extremely successful. So it's actually it's not necessarily the business the fact that you're in a cleaning business it's the fact that you you have a low margin or you're not operating it well or you're like got the cheapest contracts that's right like some cleaning businesses make a heap of money right, right? so that's but right. they that's because they're in the right niche they got the right clients so they figured something out that that really works 
That's right. So, and, uh, and I th- yeah, I think we would both agree that if you if you feel like you're stuck in that low margin space, there's opportunity to improve your business. Yes. Before you can start doing some of the things we talked about, um, but it's possible. And and if you're like, yeah, it's not possible here, then you either need to be happy with what you have, or get out of that business and do something. Yeah, new. that's true. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, Rob, this has been fantastic. I love hearing from people who've actually done this. Um, it, it's a it's a pleasure to hear the the keys that you found to growing from seven to eight figures. Very great stuff that you shared. I hope that people can start to do one of those things. Right, you can't do them all at once. If you're listening, you're like, that sounds good. That sounds good. That sounds good. You can't do it all at once. It took Rob years to do one of those things at a time. So just carve out the next thing. Get to work. Make it a little bit better. Then do the next thing. And uh, it'll it'll come around. Uh, Rob, anything else you want to share before we wrap it up? Well, I just want to say that, you know, as I've been doing this for a while, I'm now successful financially. So it really, I came to the realization that it's not just about me. And um, I pledged to give 10% of my income to charities. Uh, I did that through Giving What We Can, uh, which is an organization where you actually like physically pledge it. Because when you write it down and you say, I'm now, you know, maybe you have a bit of an intention, but it kind of like falls away. Um, So when you sign it, like you sign a document that says, I'm going to give 10%. And uh, I have a goal to save 10,000 children's lives um, or or to dramatically improve their lives through the work that I do. And this gives me extra meaning through the work that I'm doing because uh, it really motivates me and drives me because, you know, I have enough already myself. I have a beautiful house. I have kids. I'm married and I do you know, like my life is amazing. Um, but I don't really want to have like a plane or something super expensive. So like, what's the point in that? So yeah, just, just uh, encourage people to think about that uh, for themselves as well. Well, I, thank you for ending our, our episode with that. I think that elevated the level of, of, significance. I mean, everything you shared has been amazing, but you just, you just took it up a notch when we think about how, how can we impact the world using the, the benefits of what we've created, the gifts that we've been given. And I think that uh, that's a great example. So look for ways to give back. Um, I like how you said it actually now, now becomes additional fuel, purpose fuel back into what you're doing in the business. It's like, if we do this well, I get to go have more meaning in the lives that yes. I'm saving, right? So super yeah, yeah. cool, super cool. Okay, Rob, if people want to learn more about Time Doctor or if they want to connect with you on social, how would they go about doing that? Uh, so timedoctor.com or you can you can contact there or, you, or Running Remote is our conference and our book. Uh, so you can also contact there. Uh, and you could email me uh, rob at timedoctor.com as well. Give out right. my email. So so generous. Timedoctor.com, Running Remote is the book and the conference uh, where you can go and just plug into these, these great shares that he and his team are up to to help you be more effective as you're leading distributed teams and trying to scale your business. Thanks again for being here, Rob. Really appreciate it. Okay, great to chat. Okay, for all of you out there listening, please like, share, review, do all those things that help us get these episodes in front of as many seven-figure business owners as possible. We want to share these valuable lessons from our guests like Rob, uh, who, who aren't just sharing theory. They're sharing the things that have helped them accomplish what they've set out to do and, and uh, it makes a big difference. So get out there and share, and we'll see you next time on another episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast. You've been listening to the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Brett Gillerland. Be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You may also want to visit our website, EliteEntrepreneursPodcast.com, to find additional resources to grow your business from seven figures to 10 million and beyond. <laughs>